Just how widespread is swine flu? Wrap your head around this. One in five American kids probably caught the bug in the first 11 days of the month. One in five. That's according to the CDC, which says about 7% of adults also reported symptoms in early October. So what does that look like on a map? A lot of red, that's for sure. Since early 2009, world health officials have identified influenza A subtype H1N1 as a serious health threat. And as the death rate decreased over the summer, Many commented on the fact that viruses often evolve between seasons and emerge even more severe. The H1N1 virus was declared a national pandemic by President Obama early in fall 2009. But how does a national state of emergency really affect a community? This documentary will explore the health conditions at the College of Worcester in light of the nationwide concern for H1N1 and examine to what extent college officials see the virus as a threat in comparison to the mass media panic. I think epidemic is a strong word to use. I think that it, 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 there was a lot of people sick, but to this point, it's kind of been passed a bit. I believe there's a lot of small diseases everywhere that are affecting everyone. I haven't seen any illnesses going around really well. Yeah. Are you worried about getting H1N1? Not really. Yes, but I don't think as bad as um, people think it is. In some ways, it's actually less dangerous than the normal flu. I don't think the students will cooperate with anything more stringent than what the college already does. The college's official response to the H1N1 virus on campus can be seen on two fronts. The most widely known response is Worcester's reactive response, what has been labeled by many as a quarantine at the Holden Annex, a closed down dorm that is now used as an overflow center for the wellness center. We've already had the dorm set up, it's been cleaned, but so far we've been able to contain the people that we're keeping in here. We can't force you to stay, and right. that's the rumor that is out there. We're suggesting highly so that we don't pass it on. It's really consumed a great deal of our time, effort, money. You want six to eight feet be between people, mm -hmm. and the virus lives on surfaces for two to eight hours. Mm -hmm. You know, now we have carry out food from Lowry, maybe a friend can get you something, leave it at the door. In addition to the college's reactive measures, proactive measures are also in place. Although many students felt ill-informed about proactive efforts, the college does provide H1N1 vaccinations, as well as a multitude of anti-contamination literature. All of us had some concerns. However, in the end, when we found out what vaccine we were getting, how it was made for sure, um, we felt that it was safe. Um, all of us had been vaccinated, but we certainly respect it's not mandatory. I respect, uh, I respect people's concerns. Have you gotten the flu shot? Uh, no. Yeah, I should probably find out when I can get it. Yes, but I got that at home. No, I have not. I don't feel like I died with flu. No, not yet. I, I haven't gotten around to it, and I'm not sure what their availability is, so... When we get our vaccine in, we've ordered 500 doses of the H1N1 injectable and 300 doses of the nasal. And the nasal will be used by healthy people to begin with so that we can keep the doses for the people that fall within the criteria for other chronic. They're only testing if you're hospitalized. So we're just assuming with the influenza A, B test that we have that if it's A, mm -hmm. it's positive for H1N1. Yeah. We ordered immunization last spring and I have been talking with the Ohio Department of Health on a very regular basis, but yeah. we don't have it. And I was just at a meeting with um, a lot of schools in Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio and talking about it, and a lot of people don't have their vaccine yet, mm -hmm. um, even though this is considered one of the high-risk areas. Are there any things in particular you do to keep from getting sick? Um, I don't really do it on purpose, but I wash my hands, take showers, eat clean food. <laughs> yeah. You know, wash my hands, cover my mouth when I cough, General hygiene, be able to wash their hands, mm -hmm. uh, cover their mouths when they sneeze. Me? Mm -hmm. Wash my hands. Um, that's basically it. I sleep and I wash my hands. 
What do you specifically do to keep yourself from getting sick? Not much. You cover your cough was taught, it's been taught for several years, cover your cough. Um, the respiratory etiquette of you, know, you cover your cough, you do frequent hand washing, you discard your tissues and waste baskets, and I think that there was an increase in, in compliance with our respiratory etiquette. We had one physician that was very passionate that we do an educational program for people on not shaking hands. You know, do we really need to shake hands? Our society thinks we need to shake hands. Do we really need to? It's just a way of passing, passing um, germs on. Um, you go to the grocery store, you now have wipes that you can wipe the handle of your um, grocery cart. Is it really essential that, you know, how many hundred people get into in a gym and sit, you know, squished next to each other uh, at a time when we have a, a, a pandemic? I don't know. You know, maybe that's, that's something in the future that will come. I think that in, an, in a pandemic, it would be reasonable to think that we start thinking, do we continue with all of our public events or is it time to curtail them to decrease the spread? I think that the basics of infection control is hand washing, as everybody knows. And here in the hospital, we continue to monitor hand washing. We monitor compliance with isolation practice, as well as environmental cleaning. Um, and it's been a challenge for every department to know that people are, are compliant, um, during the busiest of times is, is reassuring.